let's begin. Yes. What are we talking about when we talk about the new Ukraine? Ukraine has this glorious cultural past. Which, by the way, was not a Russian construction, but a Norseman construction. The war consists of Russian aggression, but most importantly, it consists of Ukrainian resistance. No one ever expected Ukrainians to be so united fighting the aggressor. I mean, these are very tough guys, right? Freedom. Freedom uh, as a value which you are ready to, to die for. We want Ukraine to win. It could end this year. You are watching the 2023 Kyiv Jewish Forum. Next up, our first panel, maintaining America's bipartisan support for Ukraine. I'm Jeremy Stern, deputy editor of Tablet Magazine. We're here today to talk about the future of U.S. bipartisan support for Ukraine. I'm very pleased to be joined by Joseph Lieberman, former senior U.S. Senator from the great state of Connecticut, Ambassador Robert O'Brien, former National Security Advisor of the United States, and here in the studio with me, I have Andrew Mack, advisor to President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine. Uh, let's jump right in. First question, broad but simple. And Senator Lieberman, let's start with you. In what ways does the war in Ukraine affect the average American voter? Why should they care? Why is it a part of their lives? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> first, thanks for convening uh, this forum, and I'm honored to be part of it, particularly with the, the distinguished uh, panelists uh, that are on. And I, I, I have the greatest respect for Robert O'Brien, who I worked with uh, closely when he was the National Security Advisor. So uh, it's a really relevant question. Why Why should uh, what's happening in Ukraine um, matter to uh, the average American? Uh, pr probably the, the average American doesn't think about that uh, very much. Uh, it's far away. And yet I would say uh, probably at the most um, emotional and, and th at this point important level, uh, the American people uh, understand that Putin and um, Russia today are hostile to the United States, that the uh, people of Ukraine are friendly to the United States, and um, uh, what Putin has done uh, in invading Ukraine is without any justification, uh, and he's wrong, and, and yet the, here's the most important part. I think the people of America uh, have responded from the beginning to the uh, courage and um, um, willingness to fight as the smaller of the two countries involved here for their freedom and independence. And it doesn't take much. It's actually, to me, been a very um, um, encouraging, really inspiring that the, the, the spirit that motivated the, the people who founded America at the end of the 18th century really is still alive in the American people. And we see it uh, in Ukraine today, among, beginning with uh, President Zelensky and among the uh, people of Ukraine. I, I, I'll just end, uh, uh, I'm happy to come back to this. There's more to say, but I will end with this uh, personal anecdote um, last, oh, June or July, uh, I was looking for, what's the next book I'm going to read? I have a lot of books on my bookshelf here that I haven't read yet. And what popped out of me was the book 1776 by the great author David McCullough about that year in American history. And at one point, when the war is going badly for the American revolutionaries, freedom fighters, um, Washington uh, addresses his troops, and uh, he says to them, he knows uh, that uh, things are going badly, and they probably are worried about their lives and that uh, they might lose uh, in their effort to become an independent and free nation. And he said, we're up against um, the strongest military in the world today, the military of the British Empire. But uh, he said to them, we have something that they don't have. We are fighting 
for our own land. We're fighting for our freedom. We're fighting for our independence. The, the troops of the British uh, who are here are here because the king ordered them to be here. And incidentally, there are others here, the Hessians, who are here because the British uh, Empire is paying them to be here. And um, that's why Washington said to the American troops, that's why we must uh, sustain our effort and why I'm confident we will win. And of course they did. And I tell you, those war words not only could have been spoken to the people of Ukraine and to the freedom fighters in Ukraine, but they have been by President Zelensky and they're clearly uh, felt uh, in the same way. Putin is uh, uh, trying to build an empire. Most of his troops, I think, are there because he's ordered them to be there, not because they want to be. And as we know, he's paying others, the Wagner group and all the rest, to be there. And they don't want to be there either. It's a job. So I think the American people at heart are inspired by this uh, example uh, of the Ukrainian people. And that's why it matters to them. I, I can get on, on into more stuff about um, historic analogies and, and uh, way of victory uh, for Russia or Ukraine uh, will probably lead to a wider war in Europe that we would be dragged into. That's all relevant. But I think right now, what really motivates the American people uh, is their um, support for the people of Ukraine and, and the courage they've shown in pursuit of their own independence and freedom. Okay, thank you very much, Senator. Ambassador O'Brien, so, you know, a related question. For most of last year, maybe all of last year, Ukraine seemed like one of the few maybe durable bipartisan issues in American domestic politics. And I think to a great extent that's still true. But we hear increasing talk in early 2023 of maybe there being Ukraine fatigue among not only American voters, but people in Europe as well. Ukraine potentially being a kind of political football on both sides of the aisle. I mean, what do you see as the big factors in determining continued bipartisan support for Ukraine over the next, say, one, two to three years? Jeremy, that's a great question. And it's wonderful to be here with you and Andy and with my good friend Joe Lieberman. Uh, the, when I was a national security advisor, I had a, a, a council of advisors and I made it bipartisan, which is, is not easy to do these days in Washington. And, and Senator Lieberman and others were part of that, that uh, council of advisors. And I was grateful for his advice and Pete Wilson and some of those other uh, former colleagues. So it's uh, great to be with you, Senator and, and Andy. Look, I, I think there's a, a real question uh, about how Ukraine maintains the uh, support that it has among the American people. We're a very polarized country right now. And uh, one of the things that has pulled us together, as you mentioned, Jeremy, is the bipartisan support for Ukraine. And I think that bipartisan support is continuing. Uh, I, I don't see it fading away. But I think there's some things that Ukraine has control over to, to maintain that support and some things they don't have control over. But I, I, I lay out a couple of factors. Number one, I think it's very important for the Ukrainian government uh, to make sure that it behaves in America with its diplomacy on a very bipartisan basis. It, the, the presidency in America, the executive office has so much power and, and they're, they're the folks who are supplying the equipment and, uh, and interacting with the, the Ukrainian government daily. So it's very easy to get drawn into the White House orbit and, and the, the Ukrainians should, they should be very, very close to the White House. But at the same time, they don't wanna be, look as if they're, they're attached to the, the Biden White House as we go into a, a political season, a, a new election campaign for president of the United States. Ukraine has to be about Ukraine and, and it has to maintain bipartisan support. So it has to avoid any politics. Number two, I think Ukraine has to ensure that the corruption fight, which has been going on since I first went to Ukraine and back in 2014 after the Maiden revolution, Ukraine has to continue to fight corruption so that, so that the American people and the Europeans understand that the money that's going to Ukraine, the, the, the treasure and the material that's going to support the Ukrainians in this fight is actually getting to the soldiers at the front lines, the war fighters, to those people that have shown such daring and boldness that, that Joe talked about. I think number three is they've got to continue the valiant defense of Ukraine. And, and that's a lot for us to ask. Uh, the Europeans and Americans, and I, I think, we think we would pat ourselves a little bit on the back too much for what's happened in Ukraine. We've supplied material, we've supplied weapon systems, platforms, but it's the Ukrainian people that have been so 
daring and they've been so resilient and so uh, courageous in their in their fight against Russia. I mean, this is a, a, a situation that most of us thought would be over in two or three weeks. We thought the Russians would roll in and and take Kiev and and capture Zelensky, President Zelensky and his family and and install a puppet government. And just the opposite's happened. The Ukrainians have, have fought magnificently, and they've they've shown the world a, a level of bravery that and heroism that we haven't seen since maybe the Second World War. And so they've got to keep up the defense. The, the last comment I'll make is uh, the fourth point is Europe has to really contribute. And that's not something that's totally in the Ukraine's control. But Americans can't care more about a war in Europe than the Europeans care about a war in Europe. And, and Ukraine has some wonderful allies in Poland and the Czech Republic and Slovakia and, and the UK. Uh, France has been stalwart. The Germans always seem to do the right, right thing, but it's after a lot of kicking and screaming to get there. But the Europeans really need to come together and put in the kind of support for Ukraine uh, that the Americans have, both on the weapons side, but also on the development side, on the ec ec economic side. And, uh, and so that's something the Ukrainians are going to need to continue to encourage their European friends to stay involved, because if Europe draws back, or if Europe wants to go back to how it was, especially Germany with the Russians, uh, that's going to make it very difficult to rally continued support in America. So I think those are the four factors. Three are in control of Ukraine. One's a little tougher with, uh, with Europe. But, but I, look, I, I, I believe that this is bipartisan support for Ukraine will continue. This is a fight for freedom against uh, dictatorship. We saw what happened when, when people didn't want to get involved in a faraway place with a dispute we knew little about back in 1938. And we, we realized that appeasement can't say to dictator. Putin won't be sated by Ukraine. It'll be Moldova next. It'll be uh, the Baltics. It'll be Poland. And his friend, his unlimited partner, Xi Jinping, who's watching this war very closely in Beijing, is, is looking to see if this is a, a, a green light or if he can take some sort of lesson from this that would allow him to invade our democratic friends in Taiwan. So this, this war has enormous implications for the American people, but also for the West and for the idea of freedom. And uh, we need to stick together, uh, Republicans and Democrats, and, and support our friends in Ukraine. And, and they have to do the heavy lifting. It's, 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 it's easy for us to say we'll continue to support Ukraine. And frankly, it's somewhat easy for us to send money and material. Uh, it's the Ukrainians themselves that are that are that are spending their 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 blood in addition to their treasure to defend their homeland, and and they've got our prayers and uh, and our support. Thank you, Ambassador. So, Andrew Mack, you're in regular touch with the Zelensky administration. They rely on you for advice mm -hmm. and analysis about U.S. domestic uh, dynamics and politics. How do you interpret the situation here for them and what they need to pay attention to? So, first of all, uh, thank you for having me here. It's great to be on such an esteemed panel. Both the ambassador and the senator have been icons of American foreign policy for a very long time and great supporters of, of Ukraine. Um, so, you know, in terms of how I try to interpret this, right, uh, for the Zelensky administration, I think from my perspective, the bipartisan support has been much stronger than I anticipated. Um, when about, you know, this time last year, it was unclear how the war would uh, unfold. It was unclear how the war uh, would develop. Or, you know, everyone said two, three days, one week, two, two, two weeks. And uh, quite honestly, there was a reluctance le leading up to the war to supply Ukraine with the weapons that it needed because there was fear, especially after what happened in Afghanistan, that um, uh, this would be wasted resources. Um, I think the most critical part of securing bipartisan support were the first few days and weeks where Ukraine showed the world and with everybody here watching that it can win, it will win, uh, and it's going to fight uh, to the very end. Uh, once that hurdle was uh, overcome, the amount of bipartisan support greatly uh, exceeded any estimate that we had had. Um, with the exception of a few fringe elements in both parties. We literally had 80, 90 percent support, and I believe the vast majority of that support one year later still is still there. So if, for example, uh, Vladimir Putin thought that he could run out the clock, that he uh, could uh, keep this war going for a year, two years, and people would lose interest, so far, uh, if that is his calculation, this has been proven wrong. 
Um, so I do agree, uh, Ukraine definitely needs and I, uh, to maintain a strong bipartisan uh, agenda and support here. Um, and, you know, I, I was very heartened to see Senator McConnell. He wore the brightest blue and yellow flag I've ever seen during the State of the Union a couple days ago. Uh, so I think the leadership of the parties um, on, in both the House and, and the Senate uh, are with us 100%, both on the Democratic and on the Republican side. Um, and I don't foresee any circumstance where that would change uh, you know, in for the foreseeable future. Um, so overall, we're very heartened by what by what we see. Also, you know, uh, obviously the support from the from the uh, people, you know, and I thought that the Ukrainian flags were only in the D.C. area. Having traveled uh, in the summer and fall throughout the country, they're everywhere. And uh, this again shows me that the level of support uh, across the country to help Ukraine actually, I don't think, has subsided in any way. If anything, it seems to have. And increased as they see Ukraine, uh, as they see Ukraine forging uh, for a victory. Right. Thanks very much. Support for the war in Ukraine depends, as always, in the government politics life on leadership, and uh, uh, we cannot allow, as the ambassador uh, said, that we can, Max said, we cannot allow. Uh, Ukraine to become a partisan football. We're, we're coming into a presidential campaign. It's going to be a spirited congressional campaign, 2024. And uh, th there's always a temptation in those campaigns uh, to um, uh, to look for a distinguishing issue, and one could find it either in the, the cost of supporting the Ukrainian uh, fighters. Uh, or in, uh, as Robert said, uh, to the, the relatively less support, although pretty good so far, from our European allies. So the, the, the best hope here is for all of us who care about this fight and know how important it is to America's security, European security, and world security, to the idea of freedom, uh, to uh, make sure that nobody's tempted to make uh, partisan politics out of uh, the war in Ukraine and our support for the Ukrainian people. Absolutely. Well, we have with us here one of the great uh, experts in the country on the inner workings of the U.S. Congress and one of the great experts on the inner workings of uh, the executive branch and the White House in particular. So a question about process. Um, so we've seen a pattern over the course of the last year where the Ukrainians make requests for certain weapon systems from the Americans and from the Europeans that we begin by, in some ways, declining kind of on principle. And then over time, we incrementally or gradually uh, grant the request, presumably in order to avoid the impression of rapid escalation with Russia. We saw this in the past with HIMARS, most recently with tanks. Now the issues seem to be either fighter jets or maybe ATACMs. So the question is, what, do you see, what are the Ukrainians asking for now? Why isn't the U.S. providing them? And in your view, should we be providing them? Or is the administration and Congress to together doing a good job of you know, balancing our obligations to the Ukrainians with our obligations to avoiding the impression of a direct NATO-Russia uh, confrontation? Uh, Ambassador O'Brien, let's start with you. Well, thanks, Jeremy. It's a, it's a great question. And we saw this emerge early on. Uh, the most prominent example were the MiGs, that Poland wanted to give MiGs to uh, Ukraine. The Ukrainian pilots are trying to fly them. Uh, I thought we should have gotten that deal done. But I thought we should have gotten it done quietly. I, I kind of jokingly said if uh, Gina Haspel was still the director of the uh, CIA, she would have sold the, Ukraine, the, uh, the, the planes to Ukraine through a, a Russian broker, so Putin would have gotten his 10%. Uh, the Ukrainians would have gotten their planes and everyone would have been happy. But uh, look, I, I think there's too much of this that's going on uh, in public, whether it's the German leopards or attack them from the U.S. or what kind of fighter planes we're going to need the Ukrainians. I, I believe in a situation like this, and it, it is a fraught situation. We need to avoid an escalation where we're dealing with a nuclear power. Uh, Russia's not doing too well on the conventional battlefield, but they've got 1,250 strategic nuclear weapons pointed at the United States. And they've got another 2,500 nuclear weapons 
tactical nuclear weapons that could be used in Europe. And so we do have to avoid escalation. But I think I think both sides would be better off. I think Ukraine would be better off in the West, Western Europe and the United States would be better off if these conversations could take place quietly and if the weapon systems could be delivered quietly. It, you know, if we thought that by announcing that a certain system or platform was going to Ukraine, that that would allow uh, that, that that would spur a peace talk or uh, a ceasefire or, or it would have some impact tactically or strategically, that might be a reason to announce it. But I think otherwise, we're better off getting the Ukrainians the equipment they need, uh, figuring out how to get them the jets they need, uh, how to get them the the longer range artillery that they require, the long range fires. But I would do it quietly, and, and I do it with the Europeans a little more quietly than has been done before. I think we've we've given the Russians too much say in what what the red lines may or may not be. I think we've set some red lines for ourselves that that may not have been necessary. And I I just think normally in a, a, a very complex, dangerous situation like this one. We need to get the Ukrainians everything they need to win, but I think we can do it a lot in, in a lot less uh, with a lot less fanfare, so to speak. Senator Lieberman, let's go to you, and uh, in particular the congressional viewpoint on this. What role is Congress playing in this, or should it be playing? Right. Well, again, it's a very partisan time, uh, and there's division on almost any issue. There's less division on this one. Every now and then, there's been. A, a voice that says, why, why are we giving the Ukrainians so much? But I think generally, uh, uh, there's a feeling we, we've got to give the Ukrainians what they say they need or we agree they need and do it as soon as possible. I think this pattern that you've described and that Robert has commented on uh, uh, wisely of uh, uh, responding to every request from the Ukrainians saying no and then uh, eventually saying yes uh, gets us nothing. Uh, if in fact this delay on our side and the European side is somehow calculated not to upset Putin or to lead him to believe that uh, this is a conflict between uh, NATO and uh, Putin, Russia, uh, it, it's too late for that. This is a conflict between uh, NATO and Russia. Um, uh, Ukraine is not a, a member of NATO, unfortunately, but um, obviously the NATO countries, including members of NATO close by like Poland and and the Baltic states are, are sincerely, and I think accurately, realistically worried that if uh, we and NATO sat back and allowed uh, Russia to run over Ukraine, that they wouldn't stop there. Putin wouldn't stop there. He'd be out of the Baltics, onto uh, uh, Poland. Um, so uh, what I'm saying is, NATO is in a war with uh, Putin's Russia in every way, but the presence of um, NATO personnel on the ground in Ukraine, because the Ukrainian fighters are. are are perfectly able to carry that fight, but they need uh, advanced weaponry to meet the savage attacks uh, of the Russians. And therefore, I don't understand why we've delayed. I think we should give them every weapon system they say they need, that our military agrees they need to prevail and that we can afford uh, to send them. And the sooner uh, the better, because um, we're in this fight. And uh, if, God forbid, Russia seems to prevail in the end, uh, it will not just be a, a victory for Russia. It will be a, and a defeat for the people of Ukraine. It will be an historic and terrible defeat for NATO, including particularly uh, the United States of America, and will compromise our freedom going forward, including uh, as we look uh, to the east and uh, the, the rising threat from uh, China. Uh, we've got to win this one. Uh, I mean, if I, in the spirit of bipartisanship that uh, we've invoked here already a few times, uh, I want to quote President Reagan, who, when during the Cold War, he was asked by somebody in the media, how is this going to end, Mr. President? And he gave us a wonderfully Reagan-esque answer. I will tell you how the Cold War will end. We win, they lose. And however this ends, it, it's got to be seen by 
everybody in the world that the Ukrainians won and the Russians lost. Thank you. Andrew, so what's your sense of uh, what the Ukrainians are asking for now from the Americans that we're either being slow to provide or saying we're not going to provide? And also, what's your sense of what will it take to get there? Right. Well, first of all, let me just say that I don't think the American people are doing this for a tie or, you know, some kind of stale, stalemate Minsk III type of arrangement, which is what some of the, uh, you know, more skeptical people are suggesting should happen now or very soon. Uh, so I definitely think if we're investing so much money, resources, capital, uh, being the United States and the co collective West, we want to win. We don't want to just, you know, uh, give Putin only 10% of the country as opposed to 30% of the country. That's not a victory, right? Um, in terms of the weapons supply, I mean, it's very frustrating, uh, both from the inside and looking, you know, from the outside. You know, there's all these jokes, right? Uh, when, you know, the uh, Europeans or, you know, the administration say, Never will we give a tank. That means if they say it Monday, that means by Friday there'll be uh, there'll be anonymous reports that tanks will, will will be will be given on you know the next Monday, right? And this has turned into a joke because you know if you look at uh, the last year of all the requests the Ukrainians have made, and to be honest, the Ukrainians have made those requests well before the war even started, right? The requests for patriots, for tanks, for planes. This is not new. Um, this goes back to 2014, um, and uh, when uh, and when the president took office in Kiev, he immediately started uh, by pressing on those requests here. Um, so I think you know from the Ukrainian perspective, there's just a kind of confusion as to okay, why do you think a patriot? missile is escalatory in April of 22, but not in January of 23. Why do you think an attackum is more menacing uh, and can lead to World War III, but a high mark can't, right? So that's the, that's the kind of confusion in Kiev. We don't really understand uh, where the escalation risks, how they are perceived here. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, if we start playing the nuclear blackmail game, right, I mean, you know, uh, Putin has threatened the Ukrainian leaders as well with nuclear war. And um, uh, the Russians, if you look at from when this war started, actually days before it started, uh, I think virtually every threat that they have made hasn't happened, right? So remember, at first they said, we will bomb the supply lines, even in NATO con countries, we reserve the right, don't you dare do this, don't you dare do that. Okay, well, none of that happened, right? Um, so um, we also, you know, the Ukrainians don't necessarily see Putin using nuclear weapons in Ukraine for a number of reasons, right? At the same time, uh, there's definitely an understanding in Kiev that, uh, God forbid, the, you know, the U.S. and NATO uh, engage directly with the Russians because they do understand that that could lead to unforeseen circumstances, which doesn't help their cause. So the Ukrainians feel they're perfectly comfortable and able to fight this war, they just need uh, the military support uh, and the training that they haven't been able to get for many for uh, since the last you know since 2014 when they were asking for it. Now, one thing to bear in mind, even though the amount of Western military support and the U.S. support, especially, has been historic. Ukrainians are still outgunned, right? Uh, you know, the, the Russians have endless amount of artillery, endless amount of ammo. Uh, the Russians uh, have 300 MiGs, uh, com combat planes in the theater. You know, Ukraine has, I think, 30 last time I checked. Um, you know, so it's not that Ukraine is saying, you know, we need to uh, basically uh, double uh, what the Russians have. We're, the Ukrainians are saying, you know, this is sort of, the requests are based on a bare minimum that Ukraine needs to defend its territory and to retake the territory that was seized. Um, so it's not that Ukraine is seeking to become a global superpower, a, a military power. They're, you know, this is, you know, the requests are actually quite modest coming from Kiev uh, based on what the adversary has. Well, let's end the discussion today on a rather difficult question. And it's difficult because this war is the Ukrainians' war. They are the ones fighting. They're the ones dying. So it sounds a little callous, maybe. But this is a panel about the future of US and US bipartisan support for Ukraine. And it's an important question, I think, for, for all the Americans in our audience. And the question is, 
What is the U.S. end game in Ukraine, or what should it be? Um, possibilities you hear talked about often are the end game should be a Ukrainian victory with the reclamation of all previously lost territories, or it should be a negotiated settlement that includes the Russian annexation of some territories that have been lost since 2014 or since last year. Um, another possibility would be Ukrainian accession to the EU or to NATO, some say regime change in Moscow. These are all very, very different end games, but it would be good to hear, I think, from all our panelists, what, you know, what is U.S. strategy right now in terms of what outcome are we trying to achieve and what do you think it should be? Uh, Senator Lieberman, let's start with you. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Jeremy. That's an important uh, question. I guess I'd begin uh, the answer to this question with the way I ended the last one, uh, citing President Reagan, that uh, this has to end with uh, the world, not just we saying, but the world seeing and believing that uh, the Ukrainians won and the Russians lost and, and were punished uh, for this totally unjustified and brutal invasion of a neighboring country. The, the Russian security was not at all uh, uh, threatened by um, by Ukraine, uh, nor obviously were the values uh, which prevail in uh, Russia today. I mean, it, it is, it, it's too easy to make this parallel, some people may think, but nothing like this has happened in Europe since Hitler began to move into neighboring countries, beginning with Czechoslovakia, we didn't stop them, or the world didn't stop them, and they kept going, uh, frankly, until the Brit and uh, because the Brits stood up to them under Churchill and the U.S. under President Roosevelt uh, came in late, but not uh, not uh, too late. So um, uh, this is um, it's important to um, remember that I would say more directly in your response to your answer, how it, that is, my first statement is it has to end with the world feeling that uh, Russia was, Russia lost and they were punished as a result of um, uh, this unjustified invasion of a neighboring country. But, but the second thing is we're with the Ukrainians. They are our allies. And um, uh, you know how wars end, either one side triumphs over the other, has happened in the Second World War with the, with the Allied forces, so that that's the end of it, and and uh, the victors are in charge of what follows. Wars often end because uh, both sides essentially become exhausted or don't think they uh, can affect things much more, and they look for a kind of um, um, way to end it uh, peacefully or create a peace. Uh, but and when we get to that point. Uh, the second, which is more difficult, if we do, then I think the U.S. has to defer to the Ukrainian uh, government for all their, their courage, their suffering. We can't impose something on the Ukrainians. They have to uh, believe in the end, that the end of this is a victory for them and, and uh, uh, guarantees their own independence, their own freedom, and their return of uh, some of the land, or hopefully all the land that uh, Putin has accepted. And there, there are other items that will be on the table, including membership in NATO, membership in the EU. I think both of those would be justified um, um, for uh, Ukraine. But this is all down the road. Right now, we have to stand with the Ukrainians so Putin can't bully his way uh, over them and their uh, courageous fighters. This is really important to our future security. Uh, it, it is really the greatest challenge to our security um, since the Second World War, in my opinion, even though I know the Cold War was, was uh, always fraught with the possibilities of nuclear war. And we've had a lot of other wars in which we've been involved, Korea, Vietnam, etc. But the consequences of this at a time of instability, in the world with countries like China and Iran, Iran, looking at how, what, how strong the U.S. and NATO will be, how faithful we will be to our allies, how loyal we will be to the cause of freedom really will affect um, the security of the U.S. and American people and uh, the world for generations to come and uh, to make it personal for everybody. Uh, that means our children and our grandchildren. 
So uh, the, the Ukraine has to win, uh, and they have to win in a way that they uh, accept, not that anybody, includes, including the U.S. or NATO, impose on them. Thank you very much. Ambassador O'Brien, what is the U.S. endgame in Ukraine, or what do you believe it should be? Well, listen, after hearing that eloquent uh, statement from Senator Lieberman, I find myself in, in agreement with him. Uh, look, we, we have the, the idea that a neighbor, a one country can conquer its neighbor and obtain good title to that territory that hasn't been part of international law since at least the end of the First World War, that, that a, a stronger, a bigger neighbor could just take over the, the smaller neighbor and incorporate it into its, its country or empire, and that would be viewed as good title, to use a legal term if you're a real estate lawyer. That, that, that just hasn't been a thing. When, it, when Hitler did it uh, in, in Czechoslovakia, it was a breach. When, when Mussolini tried to do it in, in uh, Ethiopia, it was a breach of, of international norms. Now, the League of Nations wasn't strong enough to stop them. But if we go back to a time when a, a larger country can conquer its smaller neighbor, we're going to have the, the, the world is going to be a very dangerous and a very unstable place. And you're going to have the regimes that Joe talked about, Iran, looking to expand. It already is using proxies, but it's going to discard the proxies and just invade its neighbors itself. Uh, Xi Jinping is already talking about invading Taiwan using the same excuses, historical rights, that uh, Putin has used for, for Ukraine. So we, we can't go back to that kind of a system. Uh, number two, you know, Ukraine has to decide what it's going to do. It's not for the American people to decide and for the American government to decide what Ukraine's going to do to end this war. We have to support the Ukrainians and, and whatever. There may come a time that they decide to cede some territory, to not cede territory, uh, to fight on. We need to support the Ukrainians. I think this is ultimately uh, up to them. As far as some of the things that we can do to protect Ukraine long term in the event of a peace or even if, if peace isn't reached uh, anytime soon, I think EU membership for Ukraine is something that, that needs to happen immediately. It's an economic uh, arrangement. Uh, it's it's a key to, to, to European uh, solidarity. And I think the Europeans, we haven't asked much of the Europeans, either in the Cold War or in, in sense in the war on terror or in, in this war. We've the, the, the U.S. has bore the burden, uh, obviously in this case with the Ukrainians who are doing the fighting. The Europeans need to step up, and this idea that it'll take some five to ten years to get Ukraine in the EU, that, that's just not acceptable. Ukraine should be made a part of the EU soon. That would show strength, it would show the determination of the Russians, it would show the Russians that they're not going to have an easy, quick victory. Uh, as far as NATO goes, a, it's, a, it's a little more complicated with NATO than EU membership, because NATO is a military alliance. And NATO has Article 5, which is sacrosanct, so that if one member of the country is attacked, uh, then all the countries consider themselves to be attacked and will come to the aid of the, the country that's in danger. Here we have an ongoing war, and we have an ongoing war with the nuclear power. So I think NATO should do everything it can, as it has been, to support the Ukrainian people, because you support the Ukrainian war fa fighters, and, and Joe talked about this, and Andy talked about it. You know, Ukraine's not asking for us to impose a no-fly zone. They're asking for the planes so their pilots can impose their own no-fly zone over their own sovereign territory. They're not asking for American troops, unlike other countries, to come patrol the border with Russia. They're, they're just asking for the tools to do it. And so we need to be there for them. And, and so I think NATO membership is a little more uh, distant. I think what the Ukrainian government can do is, uh, and it's, uh, this is a, a big ask of them, because they're in the middle of a war for ver their very survival. But I think they need to project a vision of what a Ukrainian victory means, what it means to the world security, what it means to world prosperity. Ukraine has a lot to offer in tech, in agriculture, uh, in, in tourism, in, in culture, and in religion. And I think Ukraine needs to kind of paint a vision for the world, uh, what Churchill referred to as the sunny uplands. And when he, he tried to, in the gloom of the, the Second World War, he tried to, to, to give the British people a vision of the future. I think Ukraine can do that for its own people, but also for the world. And, and that, that will also, that will rally support. And the last thing I'll mention is that, look, and J Senator Lieberman pointed this out, at the end of the day, Every war ends around a table. Even in World War II, you had Admiral Donitz signing a, a, a treaty. Uh, you had the uh, the Japanese prime minister out on the, the decks of the Missouri, uh, the battleship in Tokyo Heart in Tokyo Bay. This is gonna end up around the table. And as much as we want it to end around the table sooner rather than later, you know, the, the Ukrainians, I think, have, have from the outset have tried to negotiate. 
it's the Russians that have it. And it takes two, two parties to get to the table. We need to give the Ukrainians the tools they need to bring the Russians to the table and to get this thing resolved. But at the end of the day, I think it's for the Ukrainians themselves to resolve the, 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 the war with their Russian neighbors and not for us to impose a, a resolution or a peace on Ukraine. We've tried to do that in the past. It hasn't worked. We, we need to be there for Ukraine and we need to be there in a strong bipartisan fashion as both Andy and, and, and Joe have pointed out. So, uh, and, and in the meantime, we're gonna have to roll up our sleeves and, and it's gonna cost us some treasure, uh, but we're gonna have to do what we need with our defense industrial base to produce the, the equipment we need for our own troops, but also for the Ukrainians and others. All right, Andrew Mack, we'll close with you. So over the course of the war, we have heard from the French government, you know, messaging about how there needs to be a role for Russia and the future security of Europe. I think there's a strong impression that a lot of people have gleaned from the German government for a negotiated settlement immediately and for the fighting to stop. Also been some messaging from the American government about we need to not be too belligerent. We need to be open to peace. How are all these kinds of things received in Kiev? Um, look, uh, just some facts, right? First, Russia is 28 times the size of Ukraine, 28 times, right? Uh, the idea that Russia deserves to get some territory as a buffer, given its size is just absurd, right? Uh, second, um, again, Russia initially started the war by annexing Crimea in 14. Then they expanded the war quickly into Donbass and annexed that territory early on. And then, uh, if that wasn't enough, in September, they annexed territory that they occupied and even some that they don't control yet. And Russia has stated as its policy is to get uh, the territory that they don't control yet that they annexed in September. So in light of those facts, I mean, people in Kiev just don't understand what type of settlement there can be now, right? It's not that Russia is trying to go closer to a peaceful settlement. Russia is actually doing its best to go further away from a peaceful settlement, right? Um, also, at least to the best of my knowledge, uh, there's been no pressure uh, from the administration here on the Ukrainians to enter, to enter into a premature peace arrangement. Uh, at least, you know, I have not heard of anything like that. Uh, there's an understanding that right now, sadly, there's nobody to negotiate with. Um, in terms of the territorial claims, and I understand that cry that you know, uh, cry Crimea for whatever reason is somehow viewed as uh, potentially something that can be sacrificed to the Russians, whereas you know Kherson can't be right. Hard to explain to those people living in uh, those Ukrainians who are living under occupation in Crimea why their rights are subservient to the rights of her people living in Kherson, but this is a common held theme, right? Um, I think. From the Ukrainian perspective, the war started in Crimea, it should end in Crimea, right? Uh, that territory has to be uh, taken away from, uh, from Russia. Uh, whether ultimately that happens through military means or other means, that remains to be seen. Uh, but right now, uh, you know, this, this idea that somehow uh, the Russian government could become a, once again, a good citizen of Europe um, and uh, we, there could even be some kind of arrangement on territory that it's occupied. Again, Ukraine has had that arrangement for a decade before the war started, right? So it's not that this hasn't been tried, it's failed, right? So from the Ukrainian perspective, you know, there, there's, there has to be an understanding that all Ukrainian territory should return to Ukraine. Otherwise, the president has to explain to his people why one city is, uh, is less Ukrainian than another city, and that makes no sense. So I doubt they'll see much leeway on that. Um, where I do think potentially, you know, and I do agree that ultimately there will be a negotiation that ends this, no matter, you know, how it looks. I do think uh, that if there is a way to diplomatically uh, achieve something, uh, to, to achieve that goal, as opposed to a military way to achieve it. I think there would be a preference to do it diplomatically because it's the Ukrainians who are dying, right? Um, but right now, they, they don't see that at all. They don't see any, any uh, way to have this, uh, have anything remotely resembling a peace conference now. Uh, 
Um, and the president even offered one in, fe in February. He, often, he offered to have one here, uh, here in the States in February. Russians rejected it, I think, in about 30 seconds, right? So, you know, it's not that the Ukrainians don't want it, right? Second thing, when it comes to EU accession and NATO, uh, look, I think it's inevitable, both of them. Even, I think, Dr. Kissinger said, uh, after what's happened, Ukraine's future is with NATO, and it's with the European Union. Uh, regarding how fast it happens, I agree, the European Union accession could happen much quicker uh, than NATO accession. But I do believe both will happen in you know, the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and regardless of when and how this ends, Ukraine will be integrated with, uh, with, uh, with, the, with, with the West, with the the uh, U.S. especially, and you know, from an American interest perspective, there's a few things. One is, and for some reason, it's not often spoken of uh, here in D.C. But don't. Is there anybody who doesn't think China is watching what's happening in Ukraine, and that that will not impact any decisions they make to start a war? Of course, right. And how this war ends, and how resilient we all are in helping Ukraine, will determine, I think, whether they start a war uh, in. In, in Asia. If they think, okay, we can outlast the West for a year or two years, great, right? We can do it, right? We can do a blockade, a naval blockade, uh, and we can get what we want. So I think actually peace in Asia in many ways is determined by what happens now and how this war ends, right? Um, second thing is, even within Europe, from an American interest perspective, Ukraine is a national ally. It's the size of Poland, is bigger even. Um, and uh, together with Poland, you know, could become the new center in Europe. What I never understood is, you know, when you, when you hear the word Europe in DC, you think of Germany and France, right? Well, but why not Ukraine and Poland? You know, isn't that the future really, right? Not that Germany and France aren't, you know, won't be an integral part of Europe, but, you know, why is it only them associated with that term? Uh, I think, you know, next 20, 30 years, we'll see a Europe where Ukraine and Poland take a much larger leadership role, and that will be something to the benefit uh, of Washington. Okay, well, on that very sobering note, I want to thank Ambassador Robert O'Brien, Senator Joseph Lieberman, Andrew Mack. This has been a fantastic and very informative discussion. So on behalf of the Kiev Jewish Forum, I want to thank all three of you.